Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Alrighty, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Moon Moon de Chaudhry from Arizona State University. Uh, many of you remember Moon Moon from her internship uh, that she did here last summer. Moon Moon is defending in just over a month, so she's just about at PhD status. Um, Moon Moon is, uh, I guess you might say, in the vanguard of researchers working in an area called computational social science, which is basically a very interesting, contemporary, relevant munge of computer science, uh, various statistical techniques, and sort of today's big, big social media data sets. And so we are just delighted to have her here this morning. So, Moon Moon. Thank you, Scott. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for finding the time this morning and being here. Uh, the title of my talk today is going to be Information That Matters, Investigating Relevance of Entities in Social Media Networks. So before we get to this topic, let me start somewhere else from what I do. So it goes without saying, especially to the audience that we have here, is that social media and social networks are causing significant changes in our daily lives. Um, with the advent of the Web 2.0 technology, we all know that we have multiple different ways to communicate and interact with each other on different modalities. For example, we can write on somebody's Facebook wall, we can uh, vote items on Dig, um, we can write comments on blog posts on LiveJournal, or we can even post and share content on um, Twitter. And uh, this uh, domain is um, definitely the area that I'm, I'm working in. And the goal of my research so far has been to understand the dynamics and impact of these kind of online social interactions that are present in social networks and social media. And this problem is interesting because I'm sure all of us would agree here, as well as we are aware, that 140 characters can actually cause revolutions. It has caused revolution during the elections in Iran back in 2009 and during the earthquake in Haiti last year. And um, therefore, with these kind of observations that we gather from uh, the current happenings around social media, I believe the research in this direction to understand our interactions can help us understand the sustainability of culture that has begun to emerge in our digital society, which is um, emergent of this kind of interaction process. And it can also help us design, implement, and deploy the next generation of interactive social information systems um, we hope to, hope to see in the near future. And uh, why should you care about it? Well, um, if we consider two of our major products of Microsoft, like Bing and Windows Live Mail, we'll um, often see that we ask the question, um, what are those set of people that we need to target in order to advertise a particular product? Or um, what kind of ads do we want to show to um, what kind of people? Which means that we need to understand the interactions between these individuals um, on um, these two products that we are talking about. So I believe that my research can help us drive uh, viral marketing, advertising campaigns, and so forth. Um, the second example is if we consider um, a different set of Microsoft products like you know, the Xbox Live or the Office Suite or the Visual Studio, where we are essentially interested in understanding how groups collaborate, how people come together for gaming, or to understand how we can have efficient um, groups uh, working on different complex projects. So we need to understand who talks to whom and how do they talk to each other, which means that this research can help us understand collaborations. Um, the third example is if you consider Bing or like Windows Phone, of obviously the, the um, question that we often have these days is that with so much of data available, what to show and what not to show. And therefore, this research, um, if we analyze the interactions between individuals, it can help better um, interface design. And finally, if we consider, again, like Bing, um, Live Mail, Windows Phone, and so forth, um, we'll see that um, with the scale of data available, we often um, ask uh, the question, um, who are the right pe uh, set of people and what is the right set of information that 
uh, could match with those, those set of people. Basically, we are looking for information and people who could be relevant on a given topic or a uh, given set of events. Basically, we are um, looking for distributed social search. And therefore, understanding the interactions between people can help us solving this kind of applications. Um, but obviously, all these applications are very interesting. The question is, how do we analyze um, and model our interactions to actually address them? And this has been the focus of my research and my dissertation so far. Um, my key um, idea is that our interaction can manifest itself via three key aspects. Uh, to take an example, let Alice and Bob be, be two users of um, the Windows uh, of the Microsoft Xbox Live gaming software, and um, let they be exchanging messages via certain communication modality. Um, as a result of this uh, interaction process, information is exchanged between them, and also, oftentimes, this kind of interaction is visible to their own set of friends, and which is uh, the notion of the network that they're associated with. So the three key aspects of our interaction are essentially the information that um, is exchanged during the interaction process, um, the media or the channel via which the interaction takes place, and finally, the social engagement or the network that embodies this kind of interaction. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, we want to be able to uh, understand these three key aspects if we want to make sense of our interaction process. But these aspects often are enveloped in different large-scale social processes. And therefore, uh, during my research and my dissertation, I have begun to analyze these different social processes. For example, corresponding to the first aspect, information, we are interested to see how information diffuses between sets of individuals in a network. Uh, corresponding to the second aspect, um, which, uh, I, which is social engagement, I have begun to understand how communities or groups evolve due to this interaction process. And um, finally, I have begun to understand how the characteristics of the media via which communication takes place, it evolves over time. For example, how do the themes evolve, how does this in interestingness evolve, and so forth. Um, however, uh, we have a very serious problem before we can actually address these questions in an adequate and efficient manner. And that observation is the social web is really changing at a very fast rate. Um, and what exactly is changing? Well, um, new people appear, uh, new ties are formed, and uh, new interactional data appears as well. Um, so uh, to, to support this observation by some statistics, um, what we have seen from a blog post on Huffington Post is that uh, by the April of last year, Twitter was receiving as many as 600 million search queries per day. So now that's a huge number. And we also know that by um, somewhere in the middle of um, last year, Facebook reached half a billion users, which is, again, a huge number. So basically, we have a lot of data. And uh, this data is definitely interesting because it helps us study all these different social processes, um, generalize them, and so forth. Um, however, is there something more fundamental that is happening here than just the scale? I believe so. And that is exactly going to be the focus of this talk today. Um, where we are going to talk about sampling for information that matters to us. There are two simple questions that we are going to look at here. The first one is, how do we infer meaningful human networks from our interactions online? And secondly, how do we identify valuable social media content that is generated as a result of the interaction process? Um, first of all, we'll look at question, the first question. Um, to give you some background, it's a work that I did with uh, Winter Mason, J J Jake Hoffman, and Duncan Watts. And it started during my internship at uh, Yahoo Research in the summer of uh, 2009. So <clears throat> the first, uh, so the basic question that we address in this work is, how do we choose a relevant tie? Uh, because we are interested in understanding how, how we can inform meaningful networks from our interactions. It is important to first understand what ties are relevant, where ties could be relationships between people having some social or psychological meaning associated with it. So a very nice solution, we might say that, hey, why not just go to the people and ask them which ties are relevant to you? Of course, we can do that. But when we are talking of individuals or, or populations of users in the scale of millions, say on Twitter, on Facebook, can we actually do that? No, right? So obviously, that is why we. Um, 
are solving this problem. And the question that we ask is, is there a principled way that helps us find those relevant ties in um, a set of um, observed interaction over a period of time? So let us do a small exercise over here. And um, let me ask you guys uh, how frequently you guys talk to your best friends. Anyone? A couple of times a week. OK, I'm sure there will be some individuals who would like, I personally talk to my best friends. Like, Even though I consider them best friends, I talk to them like twice a month. So definitely, assuming that the, the relationship with the best friend is actually a relevant tie, um, there could be actually different frequency of communication or interaction that is associated with that relevant tie. But what is a good measure of communication that can help us infer that tie to be relevant? Well. Um, uh, that's actually the problem that we are tackling in this paper. So uh, to support it by uh, some of the previous work, um, similar problems have been faced in the past um, in typical social network research too. And um, the way of inferring social ties from interaction data is, um, has actually been investigated. And there are actually many reasonable definitions to be able to say that, hey, you know, we think that there is going to be a tie between two individuals when um, there is at least one communication between them in the past one year. We could go a little strict and say that, you know, average of one communication per week. Or we can go even more stricter and say that we are going to think that there's going to be a tie between two individuals when there is one reciprocated communication in the past one month. Of course, all of them sound reasonable, right? And uh, they can be um, of interest for different kinds of research questions, such as um, the first one could be of interest uh, when we are looking uh, for information or people in a network. Um, the second one, which is um, you know, when we are trying to focus on, on relevant ties in short scales of time, it could be interest, uh, interesting to understand uh, problems which are highly temporally volatile in nature, such as diffusion of information. And thirdly, the reciprocated communication definition could be interesting when we are um, trying to understand how people come together in groups or other kinds of homophily based hidden node properties. Um, but this doesn't solve our problem. We, what we are saying is that is there a, these are more or less ad hoc. And the question that we are asking is, is there a more principled way that given an observed communication and given a network, we can say that these are the relevant ties? So the method that we propose in this work says that um, to find relevant ties, we'll define a minimum threshold on the frequency of communication between individuals. What that means is, um, let us take an example. So these are, f say, four uh, Windows Phone users. And um, uh, these edges that you see represent the direction of communication, and their weights represent how frequently they communicate. Um, so now we want to infer a network um, in, in this um, diagram that we see, where we are going to eliminate certain ties which we think are not relevant. We are going to do so by choosing a minimum threshold on the frequency of communication. So let, let our threshold be um, this red line of a certain thickness. What we're going to do is we are going to eliminate all the edges in this um, unthresholded network that have weights less than this, this threshold. We are saying that, OK, uh, there has to be minimum of this much communication for a tie to be relevant. So um, this leaves us with this set of three uh, relevant edges in the network. We can, of course, choose a different threshold, which is slightly higher value, and we are left with only two relevant ties in the network. So the observation is that the network itself is undergoing a lot of change structurally because we are defining different values of the threshold. So um, to support this observation empirically, what we did was we focused on two different um, email data sets, and uh, we constructed networks based on who talks to whom. And, we, uh, and, and from the left side of the screen to um, the right side, we constantly increased higher and higher threshold, which gave us less and less number of relevant ties um, associated um, with, uh, between the people in the network. Um, and the observation that we have is that as we go from left to right, the network becomes more and more sparse. Uh, in a sense, the network undergoes a lot of structural change. So it means that it's important to define a relevant tie in an optimal manner so that we pick among this uh, ensemble the network which is the most meaningful. Um, our goal is therefore to infer networks for various de definitions of 
um, this uh, threshold. And our goal is to study the impact of these thresholded networks on different structural properties of the overall network, such as descriptive statistics like clustering coefficient or embeddedness, and also the ability of these networks to predict um, certain node characteristics, which just justifies the utility of these networks in different tasks. And what we are interested in is to gather some insights on what kind of th thresholds can be considered to be optimal in defining ties to be relevant. Uh, so just a brief idea of the data sets that we used in this work. The first one is a university email data set, which is a registry of uh, emails between students, faculty, and staff at a large university in the United States. Uh, has about a million emails over a two-year period. And the Enron, um, of course, uh, it's publicly available. And it's a repository of uh, emails, again, between the employees at the former Enron Corporation. About the same number of emails. Um, and about 5,000 individuals. So um, first, let us discuss um, how we construct these thresholded networks. So before we go there, what we did was to start with an unthresholded network, which is uh, similar to our Windows Phone example. We have users and who talks to, who emails whom. Um, and uh, this kind of a network had uh, symmetric edges, which is there should be at least one communication back and forth. And the weight of such an edge was the geometric mean of um, the rate of interest over a period of time between the individuals um, in the network. Um, next, what we did was we uh, wanted to eliminate certain edges in that network to infer what ties are relevant. And therefore, we chose a threshold. So the definition of threshold here was a real positive number. Um, and uh, it was equal to the annual um, rate of exchange of emails between individuals over a period of time. And we linearly chose different values of this threshold over a scale to construct a family of uh, networks. So to take examples for um, uh, the threshold five emails in a year, we have the, uh, the graph that we see on the top. And then for a slightly higher threshold, we have a sparse network. We are going to see how for these set of networks, we, um, the descriptive statistics of the network changes. Um, first of all, the global network features. What we see is that the number of connected components for these networks defined over different threshold, uh, thresholds undergoes a significant change, uh, where um, the x-axis shows the different values of the threshold and uh, the value of uh, the number of co components on the y-axis. The similar observation we can see for, uh, about the relative sizes of these connected components where we see that there is a sharp decrease because we are the graph gets sparser and we are getting a lot, lot of um, small uh, connected components. So um, similar observations can be made about the local network features where uh, when we consider reach, uh, closure, and bridge measures for each node, we know that all of these go significant changes almost in an exponential manner when we increase the threshold for the network. So what it means that, what it implies is that um, you know, when um, we are choosing different definitions to choose that relevant set of ties, um, the, the networks that we are getting are totally different. Of course, it doesn't answer the question, then what is the right threshold? And this is what we are going to see uh, right now. So what we do here is that um, our hypothesis is that a network is uh, going to be relevant when it has relevant ties, of course, and when those ties can actually help us solve a certain task. So we considered a series of prediction tasks. And um, our goal was to be able to see which of these different networks helps, gives us the best prediction accuracy or helps or is useful in solving a certain uh, research question. Um, what we did was we considered three different prediction tasks. And uh, we'll go over them briefly. The first prediction task was to uh, predict the uh, node status or gender, where the status means, in the case of the university email, whether um, a node is whether a person is a faculty, staff, or a student. What we did was we developed feature representations of each of these nodes in each thresholded network, uh, where the different features were the structural features, such as clustering coefficient, um, embeddedness, uh, node degree to hop neighborhood, and so forth. Um, given this feature representation, we trained a support vector um, regression um, uh, class, support vector uh, machine classifier um, with a Gaussian radial basis function. And uh, we uh, performed training and testing where we learned the different support vectors as well as the kernel width uh, to be able to predict uh, 
the no status and gender for these data sets. The next prediction task was to predict future communication, where we again used the same feature representation of each node. And what we did was we trained a linear model um, with the, using the past communication of each activity, which is the number of emails that every person sends. And we learned the best fit coefficients to predict the uh, future communication at, at the next time slice. And the final um, prediction task was detecting communities. So what we did was we um, fit a stochastic block model um, where we wanted to find uh, soft assignments of um, different individuals in the network um, to uh, schools. So like in the university data set, each person belongs to a certain school. Um, and then we compared these assignments through um, mutual information metric uh, with the actual school assignments. Um, so now let us take a uh, look at the results of these prediction tasks. So this is for the university email, and these are the four different um, prediction tasks. So what we, the first thing that comes to our mind from these um, results is that they kind of have the same pattern, which is the accuracy which is shown on the y-axis, it actually peaks at a non-obvious value and not on the unthresholded uh, graph that we have on the extreme uh, left side. So um, what? So we would usually expect that it's the untrusholed graph that performs the best because it has the most instances of communication available. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, um, it it uh, around uh, it kind of peaks around the same range, which is five to fifteen emails uh, over a year period. Um, the same observation can be made for the Enron email, where we have the same pattern. We see that as much as like a twenty percent boost over. Uh, the unthresholded network on the extreme left. Um, so what are the observations? So clearly, the accuracy seems to peak at a non-obvious point. Um, and uh, the increase that we see at that point or at that threshold is as much as 30% uh, over the unthresholded graph. Um, our conjecture for this observation is that when we are looking at the unthresholded graph, we have those ties or those instances of communication which are actually noisy. And therefore, they are probably not reflective of actual ties between people. So as we tune up the threshold, we are actually getting rid of that noise and increasing the signal, which uh, leads to the increase in accuracy. So the, this kind of is explanatory. But what we um, observed, uh, another very interesting artifact, was that the optimal threshold seemed to kind of be limited in a certain range, which is 5 to 10 emails an year. And it was kind of consistent for the different prediction tasks that we saw and the different data sets that we looked at. Um, so we tried to think about why did that, why it happened. And uh, it seems that um, if you think about the different prediction tasks that we can consider, they kind of belong to the same equivalence class, like you know, detecting communities or like other node attributes. They're essentially reflective of homophily or similarities between one user and the other. So maybe for this equivalence class of problems, there is actually this optimal range of thresholds in which we can find the relevant ties. And also about the data sets, we looked at both of the um, uh, data sets were emails, and they were like from the early 2000s. So maybe that was um, a habitual nature of people to send emails. And both of the, them were like organizational emails. So maybe that is a similarity. And that's why the optimal threshold that we, um, uh, the consistency in result that we saw. Um, in the future, of course, um, it'll be interesting to see how it generalizes. Um, so the conclusions is that uh, social network research so far kind of always looks at some instance of interaction data. And uh, what they do is they construct um, edges based on these instances of interaction. However, this method seems to be ad hoc because we don't really know which ties are actually the relevant ones and which ties are not. So we try to ad address a narrow version of this problem in this work where we have determined an optimal threshold condition, at least for the range of email networks, to say that uh, how we can find those that were relevant ties in the network. And surprisingly enough, this uh, optimal range seemed to be consistent across different data sets and also across the tasks that we considered. Um, some open questions that we would like to address in this um, research in the future. So um, what we have done here is to have a separate model of finding the uh, relevant ties and then performing the prediction task. So is there a way that we can actually learn this threshold condition as a model parameter inside the prediction task itself? The second question is, 
So we, we know that uh, there's a way to determine these set of relevant ties for a set of known features. Uh, does that relevant set of relevant ties or does that network representation equally hold for, um, you know, when we test it on a set of unknown features? So that will be something very interesting to investigate in the future. Um, now question two. Um, this is um, a research that uh, I did when I was over here uh, last summer with Scott Counts and Mary Sherwinsky. And um, let us begin with our motivation. So um, we all are, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of us are more or less we know about Twitter or we are on Twitter and we write um, our updates and so forth. And um, not only does Twitter allow us to keep others posted about what we are doing, but also they have started to emerge as a news media. Uh, dissipating often information about uh, news and timely happenings. Um, however, there is so much of data that is being generated um, that we often, the end user often asks the question that, how do I find the right content? I just have an information overload problem. So this is our motivation and we are trying to ask the question, how do we infer the most relevant or best set of items on a certain topic uh, from these millions or billions of pieces of information content. So um, if we think about the problem of finding relevant ties, it can actually be mapped to the problem of sampling information given a certain signal. And uh, so let us con contrast our question with a familiar example. So um, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the famous shannon Nyquist uh, sampling theorem, which says that if you have a signal and it has no frequencies over a certain frequency called the, um, uh, the Nyquist frequency, then if we pick samples which are Nyquist, twice the Nyquist frequency apart, then we can actually reconstruct back the original signal. Uh, essentially, it's a lossless uh, sampling. Um, so it seems that for this uh, genre of signals, which could be images, videos, um, the data that, that we get, get from webcams and video surveillance cameras, they have a discrete, regular, and fixed sampling lattice. And um, the time to sample each pixel, if it's an image, it's almost constant. Um, however, in our case, when we are talking of social media content, that might not be the case, because web activity doesn't have a notion of bandwidth. Also, um, what we did was we tried to look at, so what are the characteristics of this space, like the social media space? And what we found was that it is characterized by a wide range of attributes or dimensions, such as geography, who writes the content, um, then uh, what time they're writing, and so forth. So essentially, social media content space is diverse. Um, so what we did was we looked at, so what is the state of the art? I mean, do they actually address or uh, give, the, give a user in this address this diversity issue. So we did a small um, survey and we asked uh, users what tools do you use to find relevant content and the results are, are up on the slide. So it seems that most of these are, um, actually all of these are, you know, um, tools that um, helps you browse information based on a fixed attributes or uh, single dimension. So Twitter website lets you browse based on reverse chronological order, Bing Social um, uh, gives you these URLs which are highly shared in the network. But then if I'm interested to uh, focus on other attributes, how do I do that? So that's a challenge with these tools and also a motivation for this work. Um, so, the character so one of the characteristics of social media is its high dimensionality and the different dimensions we considered are geography, um, social graph, uh, whether there's a URL, uh, the theme distribution, and so forth. So we, can, we call this property as information diversity. And uh, how do we quantify this diversity? So for that, we came up with a conceptual uh, measure, um, um, which is called the diversity spectrum. So what it does is that it represents the social media content space with an information theoretic measure called the entropy. And um, on this spectrum, on the extreme left side, you'll have content that is highly homogeneous where the diversity is nearly zero. And on the right side, you'll have content that is extremely uh, heterogeneous where the diversity is almost close to one. Um, so um, obviously, um, this, this kind of formulation also makes sense from an information theoretic perspective where the entropy measure has often been used to represent the mixing or the relative representation of different um, attributes in a given sample population. Um, 
The other observation in this work when we are searching for relevant content is that, um, um, so essentially what happens is when we generate these samples or relevant content, it is being uh, consumed by the end user, and therefore our sampling process needs to benefit from mechanisms of human cognition because it is the user who is going to judge an item to be relevant or not relevant. So what we did was that um, we estimated the goodness of such a sample based on measures of human um, information processing. We considered a set of cognitive metrics that would help us judge uh, whether a sample that we generate is good or not. And some of them were engagement, uh, encoding in the long-term memory, interestingness, informativeness, and so forth. We'll come back to these in a little bit. Um, so in order to find a sample uh, from these vast uh, um, space of social media's uh, content, the two important st steps in our research have been um, given these uh, large set of dimensions, how do we find the relative significance of each of them? And then given this kind of a dimensional representation, how do we sample content that could, could match a certain desired level of diversity in the information space? First of all, um, uh, how do we find the significance of dimensions? So what we did was we sought uh, feedback uh, through a survey from 11, 11 active uh, Twitter users, and we asked them which dimensions they found to be important while browsing content, and uh, asked them to rate their importance on a scale of 1 through 7. Um, and this is what we get. Uh, not so surprisingly enough, uh, certain dimensions seem to be more important than others. For example, posting time was very important, whereas the number of friends of the user who wrote the content, which could be a tweet, wasn't that much important. So now we move on to, given this representation of uh, like a weighted version of these dimensions of social media space, how do we find a sample? Uh, so uh, let us provide a little bit of motivation here. So there is um, our motivation comes from the signal processing literature uh, in an area which is called compressive sensing or compressive sampling. So what it says is that if we have a signal which is high dimensional in nature and has very few non-zero entries, that is it is sparse, then we can essentially represent it as a linear combination of a very small number of basis components. Uh, to, uh, so borrowing that idea in our context, what we observe is that the social media content space is also very high dimensional and it is sparse too. Because if you consider um, the Twitter information space, out of all the tweets, probably very few of them are retweets, or probably very few of them have URLs in them. So it is sparse. So maybe we can represent the social media information space as through this linear combination of small number of basis components or measurements, which, which, which would greatly help us prune down the information space. So to understand it in a more formal um, and visual manner, so let our um, uh, signal, uh, which could be the social media information space like Twitter, it is given by X, which has uh, N, um, which is of the size N, and all are real. And uh, so we are interested in finding a Y of size M, where M is much smaller than N, through, uh, through some linear me measurements that are performed over X. To represent it visually, so this is our actual data. It has only K non-zero entries in it, that is it is sparse. And we are performing a transform phi, uh, which is a two-dimensional matrix, m cross n, to get uh, a prune information space y, which has m measurements, where m is much smaller than n. So what this would give us is that um, it would help us prune down the information space to a great extent. So essentially what we need to find here is how do we find this transformation uh, phi. For that, we used uh, the popular wavelet transform called the Haar wavelet. Uh, so to represent it in a diagram, we have the actual information space of size n. We perform compression on it using a wavelet transform, and we get a prune information space, which has um, k non-zero entries. So uh, now we have a prune information space. It is much, it's computationally more efficient. Uh, so how do we construct the actual sample, which is of a certain size and has a certain level of diversity? So uh, we proposed an iterative clustering framework for that purpose that uses that min tries to minimize the distortion of entropy between the sample that we generate and the desired entropy level. So what we do is we start with an empty sample and we pick any um, information unit or tweet from the space at random. Uh, what we, we keep on iteratively adding these tweets to the sample, making sure at every point that the entropy 
The normalized entropy of that sample is as close as possible to the entropy level that uh, we want to have. Yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt? What feature space are you working in here? Like what feature space are you applying the heart wave to in the so initially at some point we saw that um, social media space is high dimensional, it has dimensions like geography, um, presence of URL, um, or whether it's a retweet or not, thematic distribution, those. Oh I see, so you just came up with a set of features? Yes, we, features. we came up with our features. And which, how big was the feature space? Uh, it was around 20. 20, okay. Yeah. So uh, to put our, um, this iterative framework in a more, uh, in a formal manner, so we essentially have uh, the following objective function where our goal is to minimize the distortion in terms of L1 norm between the normalized entropy HO on adding the ith tweet uh, with the desired entropy level omega. And we continue this uh, greedy approach until uh, we reach the desired sample size. So now um, we have a method which sounds promising. Obviously the question that you might be asking is how does it compare to other possible sampling techniques or some of the metho methods that are actually used in practice? So for that, um, we performed some uh, experiments using uh, the full firehose data on Twitter over the month of June last year, having a little over a billion tweets. Um, so first of all, let us see what are the different other uh, sampling techniques that we compared our method to. So uh, we constructed a series of different sampling techniques based on utilizing variations of our sampling algorithm, which comprises three key components, which is whether or not it uses a transform, whether or not it uses entropy minimization to fit a desired level of entropy or diversity, and also weighting of the different dimensions. Um, so to take an example, what are the different uh, uh, baseline techniques? So our pr proposed method is the one in uh, the violet line we have used the wavelet transform, we have used the entropy minimization and also the weighting. And for example, baseline three um, does use the entropy minimization but doesn't use wavelet transform or weighting. And we also had two other methods which we call the most recent tweets, which is kind of how Twitter shows you uh, results on a topic and also the most tweeted URL, which is um, kind of the idea that we are gonna show the tweets which have the most shared URLs in them. So uh, some quantitative evaluation of comparing our method with these baselines. Um, so what these plots show um, is that given a certain diversity level, which are 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6 over here, um, how do the entropy of the samples that we generate by these different methods, they match to the desired level of diversity? So the desired level of diversity is uh, represented in the dotted red line in all of these. And uh, over different sample sizes shown on the x-axis, we are trying to see what is the entropy of the corresponding sample by each of these six methods. Um, so the prime observation or the takeaway here is that our method, which is again the violet line, it is the closest, that is it has the minimum distortion with respect to the desired entropy level. And to take an example, baseline three, um, which doesn't seem to use the wavelet transform or the weighting, it uh, seems to be much far off from uh, the desired entropy level. So it seems that compared to all these other variations of the sampling technique, our method performs the best in generating samples of different sizes that are very close to the diversity that we are um, wanting. So um, we also tested some uh, uh, robustness of our proposed algorithm. So note that um, one of the characteristics of our algorithm is that it's a greedy approach and it starts with a random seed. Of course, there could be other uh, ways of picking that seed. For example, if we know what kind of tweets we want to definitely include, we can start uh, from that tweet having that set of attributes. But um, just, uh, we wanted to see what happens when we choose the seed to be random. What we did was um, we checked for the overlap in the content of the samples that are generated across multiple iterations when we are choosing different seeds. And uh, what we noticed for two uh, topics, oil spill and iPhone, for across different levels of diversity and sample size, we have really high overlap across samples. So now this is really interesting because it says that no matter what, where in the information space we seed our sampling from, we essentially reach a suboptimal sample which seems to be consistent across multiple iterations. So now um, we conjecture that this probably reflects that 
the social media information space has certain regularity to it because of which when we are trying to find tweets matching a certain diversity, we essentially reach out to those structural regularities in uh, the space because of which we have high overlap. However, quantifying that regularity is um, definitely an interest in our future work. Okay, so um, going back to one of the observations that, yeah. Like a question, how, how big were the samples in, in the sets like that? Like how many tweets were in each? Um, the starting set before you did the sampling for, for those two? There was a uh, uh, 50 percent, uh, 50 to 60 percent production in, it, in the, on the pro, uh, because we had the pruning phase. But how big was the total number? Uh, it was a billion tweets in all, but it was filtered by a topic, so it was several uh, thousands. Several thousands. Yeah. Um, Okay, so going back to the observation that we had initially on um, in this talk, which is that when we are generating these samples or relevant content, uh, it is the end user who is consuming them. So obviously we need to find out how they think about these uh, samples that we are generating using our method and also the baseline techniques. So what we did was um, um, we came up with four cognitive metrics, two of which were explicit measures uh, they estimated uh, the sample quality based on interestingness and informativeness and two implicit measures, the first one being subjective duration assessment, which is the idea that um, when uh, we show a sample to a user, if uh, the user underestimates the time taken to go through it, it means that probably he or she found it really engaging and therefore um, um, they underestimate the time they thought they took to go through it. We call this measure uh, the normalized perceived duration. And the second one, uh, which is recognition memory for the tweets, uh, which is the idea that um, how well does the sample, the information that a user sees in the sample that encode, get encoded in the long-term memory, or do the users remember the information they saw in the sample? Um, to uh, evaluate our uh, proposed method again, based on these four measures, we performed a user study. So our user study had, uh, um, it sought feedback from uh, 67 participants of which um, around 65 to 70 percent were men and the rest were women. And uh, the age range was 19 to 47 years, so that's a good mix. And uh, what we did, it was a web-based application and um, what we did was we showed 12 different um, tweet samples that were generated by these different methods and over different diversity uh, parameter values. And corresponding to each sample, we asked them the questions to estimate the length of time they thought they took to go through it. Uh, the interestingness on uh, Likert scale, uh, the diversity, and the informativeness. At the end of these 12 samples, we also showed them um, a set of 72 tweets, of which 36 came from the samples they already saw, and the rest were on the same topic, but um, they actually uh, were not shown in any of the samples. And we asked them um, whether or not they had seen um, the, uh, the, the particular tweet in any of the samples through a yes no question. Um, so the idea here was that if the user found um, uh, the tweets in these, in these samples um, like worthy to be remembered, they are going to uh, reply correctly here. So the experimental design was um, we had uh, between subject topics and uh, we had within subjects for the different methods and also the diversity uh, levels. Um, so now let us take a look at some of the results of this user study based on the four cognitive measures. So um, this is what we get um, and uh, um, the y-axis shows the normalized or the raw, raw user uh, ratings for each of these measures whereas the y-axis are the different um, methods. What we see is that our method uh, performs the best among all of them, um, which has also been found to be statistically significant, at least with baseline one, two, and the most recent method. So as you'll see here is that um, for in, in, informativeness, the, uh, the recognition memory, and interestingness, we actually have the highest rating. And also for the subjective duration assessment, which is the normalized perceived duration measure, we see that uh, it was the least negative, which shows that the users were uh, able to find the content or the samples generated by our method to be relatively more engaging uh, compared to the other ones. 
So this definitely is, um, it um, shows that even on a qu qualitative scale, users found the samples generated by our method, PM, to be the best. Yeah, the differences were significant uh, for, um, with respect to baseline one, two, and most recent. We didn't see significance for three and MTU, which is the most we. I have some numbers at the end. I can show you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so um, again, one of the observations when we started this problem was that diversity makes a difference to the sampling process. So now we ask the question, but are users actually able to discern those diversity levels or not? Um, so we actually found a support in favor of that. And uh, what the slide reports is one um, explicit measure, interestingness, and one uh, implicit measure, uh, the recognition memory, for two topics. And uh, we show the measures, uh, the participant rating, separately for the three diversity levels that were considered in the user study. And interestingly, if you see, for if not all, for most of the cases, the ratings were actually better for diversity 0.1 or 0.9, um, which means that users actually found information to be more relevant when they were highly homogeneous or when they were highly heterogeneous. So now that is something really interesting. Uh, on one hand, it means that users were actually able to discern the differences in diversity. But it also shows that the change in diversity is not monotonically related to uh, the perception of relevance to the users. In fact, it um, shows this kind of a non-monotonic structure where information at the ends of the diversity spectrum are found to be more relevant compared to those in the middle. Um, uh, so the conclusions. Uh, what our primary motivation in this work was that sampling is a very important problem because we are essentially faced with gigantic amounts of data on social media today. And uh, because this information space is very diverse, it is important that the diversity measure is incorporated inside the sampling framework itself. And we validated the goodness of our sample through, um, different, uh, through a user study where we found that um, when we evaluate those samples based on cognitive measures of uh, human information consumption, uh, we are able to find that our proposed method actually um, uh, generates uh, the most relevant content compared to uh, some baselines as well as um, two um, straw uh, man versions of uh, state of the art techniques. Um, However, there are some open questions uh, which we would like to address in future work. The first one is uh, just in the last uh, experimental slide, slide, what we observed was that uh, users were able to um, find content to be more relevant when they were highly homogeneous or when they were highly heterogeneous. So this uh, leads us to the question that are there like empirical bounds on what kinds of diversity are more suited for content consumption than others? Um, the second question is related um, to the regularity of the space that we observed when we saw information to be highly overlapping despite random starts of our algorithm. So does that mean that uh, the social media information space has some sort of signature in an uh, information theoretic uh, sense? Um, and if there are such signatures indeed, then how can the sampling method itself benefit based on um, uh, these signatures? It would be interesting to see that in future work. Okay, so we come to the end. Um, so we all agree here, or at least have observed, that um, social networks are causing significant changes in our daily lives. And the inferences that we make about different social phenomena, like how groups form, how information flows in a network, or how the characteristics of the media change, this is affected by the quality of the data or the relevance of the data that we are looking at. And also, if we are, because we are interested in streamlining the user experience uh, in order to present them with uh, content, um, it is affected by the relevance of the data that we present. And both of these matter completely. Uh, let us take a look at some of my future research directions I would be um, interested to work on. Um, in the short term, I'm interested in the evolving area of what is known as uh, social media marketing. 
So some example questions in this domain could be, which could also be of interest to um, say Bing or like Windows Live Mail, uh, would be to understand where, which could be information or people, we would actually like to tap a network which lets us optimize on an economic, technological, or a cultural goal. And also, um, using the structure of these social networks and media, how do we drive computational advertising of uh, which ads to show, where to show the ad, and so forth on the web. My second <coughs> direction is uh, the study of uh, macroscopic network dynamics based on microscopic interactions. So uh, a question that has always uh, struck me was that um, how does these uh, pop culture evolve on these social systems? So for example, um, do we actually know how RT became the accepted notion of retweet or, or kind of copying one's information and transmitting it on Twitter? I would like to investigate on how these kind of um, accepted norms emerge based on our interactions. The second question is, um, we always note, at least from a telescopic level, that there is tremendous order in all of these networks. Also relates to uh, the work on fractal theory and all. Um, but we all know that at a microscopic level, it's extremely noisy communication and there's a lot of spam. So how do we go from noise to order? In the long term, I'm interested in um, understanding in a more elaborate manner the uh, properties of these attribute-rich petabyte-scale information spaces on, uh, on the web, um, which includes topics such as uh, how do we perform social computing when we move to the cloud, we have all our data on the, on the cloud and so forth. I would be interested in developing metadata standards for these large information um, spaces that helps us uh, compare and generalize across different kinds of data. And finally, also I would be interested in uh, developing a comprehensive theory of online communication, something that has happened for like face-to-face -face communication but doesn't quite exist for our communication that typically unfolds online or over the cloud. So uh, with that, I come to an end. I would like to acknowledge my advisor, um, Hari Sundaram, and also my um, collaborators at Avaya Research, Yahoo Research, and Microsoft Research, Dore Duncan, Winter, Jake, Scott, and Mary, and also all my uh, lab mates and colleagues at ASU and during my internships. Um, Thank you for being here until the end, and um, I think I'm ready for questions. I have one easy one, I think. I'm not a social <laughs> networks guy, but uh, sure. my understanding is, or at least what I know, is that a lot of these kind of networks follow the power law, or yeah. to some degree. Yeah. So how does um, the power law come into play here, for example, when you were looking for a threshold, what if I had taken you know twenty percent of the heaviest ones and just used that? How would that compare to your? How would the accuracy then compare to the optimal threshold? Accuracy, your optimal threshold, and then in the second part, um, when you were looking at the, the diversity of the data, so what if I took a twenty percent of the most focused ones and then give compare that to twenty percent of the most diverse ones and compare that to the 0.6, whatever you had in the middle. How, what's your feeling? How would that look like? Uh, um, this actually relates to um, uh, the slide that was, uh, I would ask the second question first, where we had the overlap. So um, let me see if I can go back. So what we noted was that uh, it wasn't flat, as in like you'll see that the overlap was higher over here and over here compared to somewhere in the middle. So what I think you're saying is that what happens when we consider only data which is like point low. 0.2 and 0.8, let's say. Yeah, so it's not, it's not monotonically increasing or decreasing. Our, we, we don't, uh, as I said, that this is definitely something we would like to do in future research, but it seems that the, uh, you know, the, the, the number of solutions that we might have fitting um, the criteria for relevance, it might be much lesser when it's less diverse and highly diverse compared to ones in the middle. So that's why, because we have lots of solutions over here, we have low overlap. So I think that's how, uh, uh, I think, did I answer that question? So, so what I'm just trying to figure out is, you know, power loss is like 80-20 rule. Yes. So if I just took 20, did, 
how much more intuition did we get from this if I had just taken the, I said it, I believe at point 20, at point two I would get, you know, uh, point two uh, diversity, I would get right. kind of a sweet spot and maybe at point right. eight I would get kind of a sweet spot. Um, I think we would still see the same uh, kind of patterns, although the numbers might vary. And uh, the reason being, um, uh, this kind of a, uh, observation or empirical uh, observation is more of a property of the dimensions or the sparsity of the space than whether um, the actual values of these dimensions, which is what you are saying that when we look at the head of the distribution, probably the numbers, the value of the features would be very high. For example, the frequency of communication would be very high and so forth. So I think it's more about the structure, uh, the sparsity pattern, than the actual values of the feature. So I think we'll still see the same pattern, even when we look at the head. Yeah. I think another way potentially to look at it um, is that, like you know, as you squeeze the entropy to a really small value or a really large value, you're effectively putting a lot of constraints in the data. So you're saying yeah. that I want to find the stuff that's you know really far apart from each other. I want to find the stuff that's really consistent, and there's probably not that many ways that many. Of data to yeah. do that. So seeing the kind of you know, and you've only got three points, so you can't see it maybe so low, but there's you know the kind of U shape. You might expect to see that. You see that in other problems too. Uh, phenomena where you try to like really squeeze a constraint at very low or very high end. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of what I was going to say with the solutions part. Um, and uh, actually during summer, Scott and I discussed extensively on it. So it seems that there are a lot few, few solutions at the ends of the spectrum, which is what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, following up on your comment, but there's also, when you look at multi-document summarization, right. <coughs> excuse my voice, um, that's in a sense, you know, when you create summaries from, let's say, 50 different news um, stories about a topic, mm -hmm. split them all into sentences, so you have this gigantic bag of sentences, and you have a sure. limited space, you create a summary, yeah. and you have to choose your sentences. And the best summaries are either the one where you really have diversity in the limited space that you have, so high entropy, which right. gives you sort of as much information about Diverse the news story yeah. in, in as small space as possible, yeah. or you get something uh, that's, that's very pinpointed. You know, you just yeah. get like the main fact, and that's right. the, the worst summaries are the ones where you have a mix. There's some new information and there's some repeated information, right? And right. I think it's, it's a very analogous uh, scenario in the sample. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Was this. Sorry. <clears throat> Go ahead. Was the behavior that the perceived relevance was high, higher in like being very diverse or very non diverse? Was it consistent across people or queries, or was it some some or some topics were more well, in that direction? Well, I, I must more say prone it's, to that than others. Or? It's limited for the two topics that we looked at: which is oil spill and iPhone. Um, uh, it, I mean, because we we could only have so many feedbacks from users in the user study, we focused on two topics. Um, and it, it's limited in the sense that it's limited by the 67 participants we looked at, but um, because it's over, it has a good mix of gender <coughs> and it's over a wide range of uh, different age groups. So I guess it's pretty generic. Uh, so, so it's not that some people prefer it very diverse and some people prefer it very. Well, we did. Yeah, it seems like, but we of course don't have the numbers on who prefers diverse or who prefers homogeneous. But it seems that people seem to like one of the two. So when I think about this downsampling technique right. as, when I think about applying it to sort of news-like tweets, so I'm sure. reading about the Haitian earthquake or whatever, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense to me. But then when I think about applying it to tweets that are much closer to me in my social network, mm -hmm. then I get really concerned about the fact that anomalies may be the most interesting thing. So for example, you know, maybe my friend consistently tweets about the weather or something stupid, but then suddenly tweets, I'm pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. like, I don't want that one filtered out. Right. Um, and I'm, so I'm, it's unclear to me like how this algorithm is going to not filter that one out because it's an anomaly. Right. It's just a complete one off. Well, in, in some sense, it is taken care of if you want you are ready to have diverse information because this aspect will probably be covered by the thematic distribution of the tweets right. so you might end up having different angles not just all weather tweets but um, as such our down sampling sampling technique doesn't uh, exactly uh, look at these kind of anom anom anomalies yeah. i'm also wondering if the set of features i mean i realize this is sort of speculative but i'm wondering if the set of features that I'm interested in may in fact vary with the distance 
in the network um, from the original tweet. Sure, sure. We can, we can always add that on top of um, what we have already built, and it could be a part of how we learn the weights or the significance of the dimensions. So we might actually want to weight uh, the dimensions of users who are far away compared to my immediate friends. And that is exactly a very classic example of actually personalizing this thing. Uh, like right now, it's like irrespective of who among us actually looks for information on oil spill, we are, we are always going to get the more or less the same set of topics. But in practice, we might want to personalize this. this and uh, actually, that's where waiting in this manner based on my distance could actually be useful. Yeah. In the, <clears throat> the previous study about the link Filtering. Right. Um, there's a, is there an implicit assumption there that there is an optimal link weight filtering that, that you can apply for that's relevant for every person? It seems like people have such individualistic patterns of right. communication. Right. That, that That's a very good question, actually. And uh, we, that was also one of the comments when we wrote the paper. Um, but um, we, we can always do that. But one of the problems is that actually, like, how do you how do you find out um, the that learning those um, actually individualistic thresholds could be computationally very expensive for large data sets, well, um, or or you compute some features which are sure, which are normalized for a person's total email volume. Right, or, right. Actually, in you know, some that, sense that doesn't that doesn't explode the computation. Right, right, right. But. Uh, if you if you like you know think about the different studies uh, the prediction tasks that we did they are more like macro network level they don't exactly like you know how groups form and stuff so they don't exactly look at the individual um, aspect um, and I think the individualistic aspect is is uh, taken care of to some extent uh, based on the weighting of the features that we um, saw there so basically what we had was we weighted the features based on the communication or properties of that particular user when we were doing the prediction so that kind of personalizes it to some extent but I like these weighted features on unweighted features um, but I what were these weighted by I'm sorry so so the unweighted features is representing every um, node in the network based on a certain feature. It's a set of structural attributes like clustering coefficient. Mm -hmm. We could also weight it based on how frequently that person talks to that friend of his, yep. which, yeah, okay. so, so that could be the weight. That kind of takes care of that uh, personalization of the threshold in a certain way, although it's not very intuitive directly. But um, I agree that, um, I mean, in practice, uh, different people usually have different, different thresholds. And, uh, 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 and in fact, uh, there is some work by um, uh, Rob Dunbar that, you know, the, there's a neocortex limit on the number of friends you can have, which is 150. And usually b below the number of times we talk to each other is usually much less than 50. For some, it's 20. For some, it's 30 and so forth. So it'll be interesting to actually learn those thresholds uh, at the individual level, level if, if the nature of the research question asks so. And then since you're talking about pairwise behavior, um, that's got shape over time. Sure. So this is a single snapshot study. So one of the data sets was over two years. So it was kind of uh, normalized over the two year period. We did not look at uh, individual granularities. Would be it'll be good to probably look at small time scales and see if that threshold changes for those time scales also. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. That was a really interesting about your first study was that <clears throat> it was it was neat that you had several different measures that you're looking at, right? And you found them all pointing to the same kind of thing for an inherent in your network aspect, you know, that, that you saw this effect of this peak that kind of showed up at some point no, over, these different, over these different functional tasks, yeah. which is very nice. So what's interesting is if you look at the second, the second study you're doing, um, um, uh, I agree with you that this, you know, this notion of like sampling is clearly important given the fire hose and a lot of data that's coming in, but it seems like it's potentially much more, there might be a much more diverse set of possible applications that an end user might want to do. So, so, so in this case, like you've, you've looked at, and I, th I think it's laudable that you looked at this to say, like, well, what do people like in terms of their streams? And you found some consistency in terms of high diversity. But you can imagine that maybe 
I don't know, maybe, like, you know, if you took, so, so there might be a wide variety of other things, like, for instance, people trying to predict uh, marketing trends or people trying to predict, you know, stock prices, like you have okay. done yeah. before, and various other kinds of things, and, and try to take those, uh, uh, a macro set of tasks, right. not just user preference, right. and see if you, again, see some consistencies in terms of Definitely. what kind of sampling works. Yeah. Um, on those lines, actually, the uh, the sampling technique would still, uh, at least, the, uh, you know, when we prune the information space, we can still utilize that, irrespective of what is our final task. But yeah, I agree. At least this, from the study perspective, it is very pinpointed in in the sense that we are trying to only understand from a FCI or interface design and, perspective. And, but sure. Yeah. And the real question I have there is really about the axis of diversity, because I think it's like you know, it's powerful in terms of. Uh, perception and the kind of the, the kind of place you're looking at, I think diversity makes a lot of sense. But then I wonder if you're looking at something which is more like a you know classification task yeah. or something like that, maybe diversity wouldn't be the access that would really get right. you the most benefit. Maybe it would be something else. I'm something. not sure, but, but maybe diversity would help. You know, it's hard to it's hard to. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my conjecture is that probably in a classification task, diversity is not that useful. Probably. It, it, might be, you know, I mean, some active learning stuff, you know, makes it, I mean, it, it's hard to say. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but it would be interesting to kind Definitely. of learn and see Absolutely. That, yeah. what might happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, one one of the always one thing that I always wanted to do in my dissertation, unfortunately, I don't have the time. Which is, so I did all these other social, I studied these social processes that we saw in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. But this was on all the data that was available. It there was no sense of sampling in them. So actually, it it relates to your question. Now that we have a sampling technique, what if now we study all these different okay. problems yeah. with the sample data? Do we observe the same uh, uh, dynamics? Should we do all your papers. Yeah, it's like going back. <laughs> we have time for that. You know. I know. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. We do 